Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our training on farmworker skin health. Um, I'm Nina, I'm presenting this training on behalf of Farmworker Justice. Um, Alexis, next slide, please. So we are a national nonprofit organization that seeks to improve the health, occupational safety, and living and working conditions of farm workers. Next slide, please. And the aim of this training is really to understand how skin cancer and other dermatological issues can show up in farm worker communities and also help providers give the best possible care to patients from this population. So we're gonna start with just a brief overview of our ongoing skin cancer project um, at Farm Worker Justice called Rayonidos. Uh, then we'll hear from our guest speaker on farm worker skin health issues. And we'll talk about some of the barriers facing farm workers in trying to obtain treatment and care and conclude with some best practices. And we'll have a little time hopefully at the end for questions and an evaluation. Um, next slide, please. So Rayonidos is a project that Farm Worker Justice is currently implementing with partners through the spring of 2024. Um, it builds off some of the work that we've done previously to increase awareness about skin cancer risks in farm worker communities through outreach by community health workers. Um, we know that prolonged sun exposure is a well-documented occupational hazard for ag workers. Um, but there's limited data on this. So one of the aims of this project is really to add to that research on skin cancer prevalence among farm workers and in rural communities. Um, Rayonidos also adds a navigation component. So we know that patient health navigators, especially those that are based in the communities that they're serving, have been really effective at delivering health messaging in ways that are culturally resonant and help to bridge um, some of the gaps that we see in the healthcare system. And so by training community health workers and leaders to act as patient navigators, um, the hope is to increase early detection of skin cancer among farm workers and also facilitate um, appropriate treatment and improve health outcomes. Um, next slide. So this is just a brief summary of some of the activities we're doing as part of the project and the research study. Um, we created a curriculum for patient navigators on how to support farm workers with skin cancer from the screening phase all the way through to treatment. Um, since the project began, we've trained over 50 navigators across our two partner clinic sites. And as part of the project, both clinics have organized several free skin cancer screenings that are open to the community. They've screened upwards of 400 people so far, um, and the majority of those uh, patients are farm workers. And our project partners, um, that includes the navigators, also work together to identify workable treatment pathways for any patients that screen positive for suspected skin cancer at these screenings. And throughout this project, we're also learning a lot about how to identify and address the structural barriers that can block access to appropriate specialty care. Um, I'll be talking about this a little bit more in depth later in the presentation, but now I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, uh, Sam Gill to talk about our project partners and also introduce our guest speaker for today. Um, take it thank away, you. Sam. Thank you, Nina. Hi, my name is Sam Guild. I'm the president of AIM at Melanoma, and I am incredibly honored to be a partner um, with Farm Worker Justice, um, our clinic partners, Vista Community Clinic and Finger Lakes Community Health, as well as the hospital partners, University of Rochester Medical Center, the University of California, San Diego, and Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center. Next slide. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Clayton Green. He's an associate professor of clinical dermatology at the University of Rochester. Thank you, Dr. Green, for coming. Thank you for having me. Next slide, please. Yeah, you have a number of health issues for farm workers, and it includes just typical things you would see, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory disease, and then things unique to working on the farm, the injuries, the accidents, musculoskeletal injuries, heat illnesses, and potential GI issues, depending on their access to clean drinking water. Next slide, please. Uh, the skin cancer risk with agricultural work is, at least in fair skin people, very well established. The prolonged sun exposure or intermittent intense sun exposure some evidence for pesticide exposure contributing to skin cancer and 
cancer risk in general. Age in particular is known to be associated with increasing skin cancer risk. Family history, this is more relevant to melanoma in terms of basal cells and squamous cell. The family history tends to be in your, your phototype and how your skin interacts with the sun. And then old scars, old burns can give you a unique subset of skin cancer risks. Next slide, please. There are three main types of cancers that we think about in terms of like the most common kind you're gonna run into in a clinical practice or when taking care of farm workers. Basal cell carcinomas are by far the most common. You do see these much more commonly in fair-skinned people, although you will see them in your paper hook and tan as well. They most commonly present as a solitary pink patch or an ulcer. You might see in the textbook, I think the rodent bite ulcer is one of the uh, old terms you'll hear in textbooks. Squamous cell carcinomas are also more common in fair-skinned people, but you can see them in anybody. You would see these as sort of a painful warty growth or a bleeding spot. These have the uh, chronic low-grade sun exposure is the strongest risk factor. Arsenic as well, depending on what sorts of chemicals you might be exposed to in the workplace. Melanoma is your skin cancer that's considered to be the killer of the three most commonly. This would be most commonly a solitary mole, dark, asymmetric, uneven mole, looks nothing like the rest of them. When you're approaching pretty much any patient who's not Northern or Western European ancestry, you do have to consider melanomas arising on the hands and feet or in association with the nail unit. Next slide, please. This would be a classic picture of a basal cell carcinoma. It's very subtle. You can see on the back of the ear, you have a solitary ulceration. If you look in a direction around the ulcer, you can see the shiny, somewhat pink, amorphous texture of the thing. It does blend somewhat well with the normal skin, but this would be a classic appearance for a basal cell carcinoma. Next slide, please. When you're approaching, if you're approaching patients of Central American ancestry, you're more likely to have a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. And these can be quite darkly pigmented or subtly pigmented, but they're gonna look more brown than pink. And when we talk about risk with a basal cell carcinoma, the chance of one of these metastasizing is estimated less than one in 100,000 per year. It can happen, it is incredibly rare. More typically they grow slowly and depending on the location, if they remain untreated can cause significant local destruction. So when we talk about risk with a basal cell carcinoma, we're speaking about risk that this thing comes back after treatment. And size and location of the lesion are the most important factors that determine risk of local recurrence after a treatment. Next slide, please. Um, this, is, this, is, this is an obvious lesion, but without a close inspection, it would be, it would be a fairly subtle lesion to tell, but this would be an example of just a pigmented basal cell carcinoma on face-to-face -face inspection. Next slide, please. If you get a closer look, uh, you can see on the left side, it's irregular, it's asymmetric, it's darkly pigmented. Your first thought might be this is a melanoma with this pink and brown appearance. The second slide's a more close-up picture. And one of the things you see with basal cells are these superficial ulcerations in the middle, and you will see these distinct little globules of pigment. But for even for a pigmented basal cell carcinoma, size and location still are your predictors of risk of local recurrence and removal. Next slide, please. The pigmented globules might be quite subtle. This is a very close-up picture. You can see a, it's predominantly a pink lesion, but you have these well-defined brown globules in the middle, and you see these irregular little blood vessels that sort of meander around the lesion and don't look they're going anywhere in particular. Next slide, please. Um, this is a slide that came from previous work. I think this slide illustrates an important point. Um, a superficial basal cell may just be a solitary pink patch. So if you look at enough backs, over time you develop the ability to look and see who looks out of place. And to me, this is a very, this lesion looked very out of place. On the trunk, uh, it's pretty common to diagn diagnose a superficial basal cell carcinoma as a patch of stubborn eczema. If you see something on the back you think is a solitary patch of eczema, you know, consider a superficial basal cell carcinoma as an alternative diagnosis, especially if it's a patient who had two weeks of hydrocortisone or triamcinolone cream and had no improvement. Next slide, please. 
Uh, most commonly in dermatology, we diagnose these with an office procedure called a shave biopsy, where you numb it and you shave it off, and then the pathologist can report the diagnosis in one to two weeks, depending on the workflow. Um, the risk is local recurrence after treatment within five years. So these are, when they're small and localized, very amenable to simple office treatments. Curatage and desiccation is a very common way to take care of a lesion at the time you diagnose it. Generally, we would shave biopsy it and then perform the curatage and desiccation while the patient waits. Um, for the back, the chest, the shoulders, thighs, this, this has cure rates approaching 97, 98%, depending on the study. For high-risk tumors, which are lesions with a high risk of local recurrence or a high risk of damaging underlying structures, this would be eyelids, lips, nose, ears. Mohs surgery has the best cure rate. It's approximately 99%. It's um, generally done in specialty dermatology centers, but this is sort of the ideal option if you can get this for your patients. Next slide, please. Squamous cell carcinomas have the strongest association with UV exposure. There's a whole basic science literature showing UV signature mutations within tumor suppressor genes. Um, these can metastasize, but it's still much lower risk than melanoma. The size, location, and immune as the patient determines risk of metastasis. Um, but even when you're treating most squamous cell carcinomas, you still approach your treatment success in very much the same way as a basal cell carcinoma. That's the risk of local recurrence within five years after your destructive modality. And the treatment options are the same as basal cell carcinomas, depending on size and location, uh, curatage and desiccation for small lesions, excision with four millimeter margins, or MOS for high risk lesions. This is a setting where squamous cell carcinomas that arise in older burns, thermal burns, tend to have a high risk of metastasis. Uh, th these, are, these are quite uncommon, the more common type I would expect you to see in your in farm workers would be the lesions on, in some exposed areas. Next slide, please. This would be a squamous cell carcinoma on the side of the nose. If you looked at this and thought it was a basal cell carcinoma, that would be a completely understandable thought. It's on the differential. The shape biopsy would confirm the diagnosis. And for this one, the ideal treatment would still be Mohs surgery on the side of the, Mo on the, side of the nose. Next slide, please. Here's a, slightly, here's a slightly large one on top of the ear. You would also numb this and ideally biopsy it at the time of visiting the patient. This is another, ears and lips are two sites with a higher risk of metastasis for squamous cell carcinomas. Generally, if your squamous cell carcinoma is over two centimeters, regardless of the site, you should have to worry more about metastasis. It's still rare enough that there's still some controversy in how you manage a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. So if you like any cancer, the earlier you find them, the easier it is to deal with them in the office or with a local, local procedure. Next slide, please. This would be a superficial squamous cell carcinoma or Bowen's disease. Um, it would be, it, it, these can be easy to confuse with inflamed seborrheic keratoses, which are benign. I, I, I teach my residents when you're looking at a lesion and trying to decide if it's an inflamed seborrheic keratosis or a squamous cell carcinoma. I, I tell them to look at how regular the scales and flakes are. This is highly irregular scales and flakes in the surface. Basal, um, excuse me, separate keratoses and have much more regular cobbled or berry-like scale on the top. This would be one, I believe it's in the back, that could be treated with curatage and desiccation. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and your patients who can tan darkly, the squamous cell carcinoma may also be pigmented like the basal cell carcinomas. I think I wouldn't be intimidated by pigmented basal cell carcinomas or pigmented squamous cell carcinomas. I think you know, any of the clinicians out there who are in family medicine would look at this and think it was a cancer and want to biopsy it. But, you know, squamous cell carcinoma, even this one is still very straightforward to treat. Next slide, please. You can see them on the palms and soles. Once again, um, they, they can be darker in your patients without fair skin. Uh, the hand would be another lesion where you ideally send for Mohs surgery. And to clarify, Mohs surgery is um, a type of surgery where the tumor is excised in a shape that allows complete assessment of the peripheral and deep margins. And then any site there's a positive margin, they go back and take another level. Next slide, please. Melanoma, this is the one that's the killer and does metastasize. 
there with the biopsy, the Breslow depth is a measure of from the granular layer of the epidermis down to the deepest layer of invasion of the tumor. This is the depth of the invasion. This is the most accurate prognostic indicator. Uh, shallower tumors, stage zero or stage 1A are curable with office surgeries. So these can be excised and clinic and cured if they're caught shallow. Early diagnosis and treatment saves lives. When you're approaching a mole and you're trying to decide if it's melanoma or not, the ugly duckling rule is helpful and the ABCDE is quite useful for melanoma because there are a number of benign moles that can sometimes fool you. I, I, I mentioned earlier, the ugly duckling is a, I believe a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. So depending on where your patient's from, if you're telling them to use the ugly duckling rule to look for a melanoma or a changing mole, they might not recognize the reference. So then you have to tell them the ugly duckling fairy tale. Next story, please. You diagnose with the biopsy and your bio shave biopsies and punch biopsies are actually very quick, simple procedures, but the clinic workflow has to be set up so you can do it at the time of biopsy, at the time of the clinic visit, especially if a patient who is maybe a seasonal worker or maybe undocumented or you're not sure what the follow-up, like you, you, you can get the, you, you, you can do this procedure while the patient's there. And a broad shave biopsy, if it's a shallow, a shallow melanoma, you can get underneath it with the shave and you can get accurate staging in terms of accurate ability to measure the Breslow depth of the tumor. A punch biopsy is better because a punch biopsy is down to the fat. If it's a small tumor, you could, if, it's a, if it's a small one, less than six millimeters, you can punch around it. That's a very reasonable technique to biopsy them. But if you have a larger lesion, say one centimeter, one and a half centimeter, if you take a small punch, you might get, you might miss the actual cancer in the punch. So if you have to decide with a big lesion or a small lesion, you're probably better off with a broad shave than a punch and missing the actual cancer. There is controversy with this. I mean, we could talk more at some point, but just if you have the patient there, you need to get the diagnosis. You know, I think you use the tool you have at your disposal. Next slide, please. Um, this is a great slide I got from Alice Pentland for the AB, CBE, and melanoma. Asymmetry means can you fold it on itself in all directions? This is a nice pink, symmetric, even intradermal nevus. Next slide, please. Um, these are asymmetric. You can't fold these on themselves evenly in any direction. Next slide, please. Regular means um, regular nice borders, a nice crisp, sharp border there. Next slide, please. These are irregular. While, they're, while the one on the right symmetric it is irregular, the pigment network is irregular and the borders are blurry. Next slide, please. Color uh, or consistency, that, that thing's a nice, even, even though it's dark, it's symmetric, well demarcated, homogeneous color, consistent color. Next slide, please. You see, this is these are variable. There's all manner of color on the inside, especially in the one of the, the two up top. When you see pink and black, that that's that's a that's pink and black combinations of particular worrisome color combo. But you can look at these and see how it would. You'd look at a pigmented basal cell. Your you know first couple I diagnosed as a resident, I thought I was going to have melanomas, but they were pigmented basal cells. Next slide, please. D is diameter. Uh, this would be six millimeters, roughly the cutoff, and six millimeters a little bigger than a number two lead pencil eraser. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are larger lesions. You can see here the, the ruler next to them, the centimeters, the inner and a half. You know, the bottom one, you've got those weird kind of scallop borders. Next slide, please. And E is evolution or change. You can see this. That this is the same lesion serially photographed. That first picture. On the far left, it's not very exciting looking. It's kind of muddy, kind of subtle, not that exciting. Might be a separate keratosis or a small intigo, but you can see this thing is broadening and darkening and getting more and more concerning. If you have people that don't want biopsies and they have good access, serial photography can be done. It, 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 there are papers out there with that as a possibility, but if you're gonna photograph something, make sure you bring them back and three months or six months of the latest for comparison. You know, bad, bad things change over the course of months. So the patient may actually notice the change and be able to help you with that. Next slide, please. Um, this would be an example of a melanoma in the typical, you know, these look like the Germanic ancestry farmers I took care of in central Wisconsin for 10 years. It's a blurry photo, but this is a muddy, asymmetric, large, heterogeneously colored lesion. Next slide, please. And that's an exposed area. 
Um, I think you would all get this one too on the leg. This is a, there's a, there's a big asymmetric uneven lesion. There's a nodular component at the top and then there's a macular component at the bottom. Actually that pink thing above it probably is also, a, that pink eroded thing is probably a basal cell too in the picture. Next slide, please. Um, look under your bra, look under your shirt, you know, the, the, depending on what your patient's wearing, your patient's got a sports bra on, you might totally miss this lesion. So this is why in derm, it's a constant discussion in dermatology, people come for acne and they're surprised we offer to do a full skin check. It's like, well, you, and there are, there are papers in the derm literature that kind of show that people will come to us for something unrelated. And it's fairly frequently, we do a full skin exam, we'll find a skin cancer. So you know, just get their shirt off and look for anything that stands out of place. I think, I think anybody, I think anybody who saw this in the audience, medical training or otherwise, would be very suspicious about the spot. Next slide, please. Um, same thing with this one. This is a, this this is a this this lesion, a big purple hard knot like this, should be very concerning. You know, melanomas aren't always brown; they might be fully pink or kind of purple. Uh, you know, a nodule like this, you should look at and immediately think of skin cancer. Is the amelanotic melanoma. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, a special concern for Central American patients: subungual or an AO unit associated melanoma. You have to think about the A, B, C, D, E apply to this one too. And and I, I have a reference down here for this Journal of American Academy of Dermatology article, which is a really nice one for discussing this A, B, C, D criteria pull, uh, applied to nail bed melanomas. Twenty to ninety, you know, peak incidence fifty to seventy. Um, the nail band is going to be brown or black, and this is your longitudinal mononychia. It's greater than three millimeters in, in width and a blurred border, particularly a blurred border at the proximal nail fold. Changing, rapid change of band, or some kind of nail dystrophy, right? Like the nails, the nails, the nails beat up, the nails lifting off the plate, there's, there's bleeding, or you've treated them for nail fungus and it didn't get better, you know, that kind of thing. There, there is a digital preference, the thumb uh, and the index, the two more common sites for cervical melanomas. With, with patients of color, you can have nail bands as a variant of normal. Uh, if they have similar looking nail band, nail longitudinal mononychia of all their nails or multiple nails, that's much more reassuring than a single digit. A solitary dark nail longitudinal nail band is more concerning than multiple, especially on the dominant hand, especially in the index or thumb. And extension of the nail folds or free of the nail plate should raise your suspicion. You also can have benign moles under the nails. And then family history melanoma you would also consider when weighing your debt, weighing your consideration. Next slide, please. This is a really good example of a subungal melanoma. You have a very dark longitudinal nail band. You have blurring and a muddy border at the proximal aspect. And if you can see that blue-black pigment is kind of bleeding onto the, the nail fold. This is one of those things where, you know, if this shows up in my clinic, I would biopsy it. These are a little more technically, it's still, it's still a simple punch biopsy, but biopsying into the nail is a little more technically challenging. You have to kind of numb the tip of the finger. You could do a wing block, just local anesthetic beneath into the nail fold, let it sit for 15, 20 minutes. And then you would just do a punch biopsy, maybe a three millimeter punch biopsy right into the proximal aspect of the nail plate where the pigment is the most blurred. Next slide, please. This is of course a more advanced case. Uh, Bob Marley died of a melanoma on his toe. So this is, this is one that went for quite months and months and years and you know, it was very advanced nodular melanoma. Next slide, please. There are many other possible skin diseases farm workers can get depending on where they're, what they're working with. You can certainly see allergic contact dermatitis with poison ivy or hogweed. There are other plants that can cause allergic contact. Certainly irritant contact dermatitis with washing uh, or cleaning. Lyme disease, you know, I spent 10 years since Wisconsin. We definitely saw Lyme disease there. Lyme disease is showing up here more and more in Western New York. Uh, your cattle workers, you, you'll see tinea, this is cattle ringworm in, the, in your in your dairy workers and beef workers, and then you know this is this is something I couldn't find any data on. Like, what are the specific inflammatory skin diseases of farm workers? I know Finger Lakes has an e-consult service they can utilize. So 
you know, am I able to help with these video pictures? Next slide. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Dr. Green. Yes, of course. Um, so now that we have um, an understanding of how skin cancer can show up in farm workers, um, we're just going to shift to discussing what barriers can often stand in the way of them getting treatment. Um, next slide. Thank you, Dr. Green, for putting your um, email in the chat. It's helpful. Um, so one barrier is an information gap. Um, health information is often not available in the languages that farm workers are most comfortable communicating in. Um, that's often Spanish or an indigenous language. And that information might not also be in a format that's easily understood or at an appropriate literacy level for this patient population. Um, there might also be misconceptions around the risks of getting skin cancer, um, particularly if they're darker skinned, they might not realize they might need to take preventative measures to protect themselves from sun exposure. They might not know how to check themselves for suspicious spots, what to look out for. Um, and there might also be other considerations at work. Um, for example, a farm worker might understand the importance of using sunscreen, but they may need to factor in practical considerations, like if the sunscreen runs into their eyes, it might just be impractical to, or uncomfortable to use it. Um, next slide, please. Another big barrier to care is finances. So farm workers on average have low incomes and about half are uninsured or underinsured, um, and they may not know if they can afford health insurance or health care, preventative or otherwise. Um, not all farm workers are eligible for Medicaid due to immigration status, um, and there might be additional restrictions for specialty care providers. Um, and because farm workers have limitations on their time um, and income, it might not always be feasible for them to miss work in order to make appointments or pay for preventative measures like a cancer screening. Next slide, please. And then there are uh, logistical concerns. So many farm workers don't have their own transportation. They tend to live and work in rural areas where public transportation options are limited. Um, work schedules, as we mentioned, uh, might prevent them from being able to attend in-person skin cancer screening. Um, and just to note that many of the community skin cancer screenings organized by our clinics uh, for Reunidos have quite intentionally paired or integrated uh, the skin cancer screening event with other services, whether that's um, COVID vaccination, flu shots, food distribution, um, or they're organizing the screenings at agricultural work sites. So going to where farm workers are. Um, and we find that increases the likelihoods of farm workers attending and participating in the screening. Um, migrant farm workers are also um, moving to follow farm jobs, um, which makes it more difficult to keep track of them and provide continuous care. So um, we might see a doctor, they might see a doctor in the US, get a diagnosis and then depart for Mexico a week later. Um, and then there are not enough dermatologists and specialty care providers in the places where farm workers live. So it might be several months before they can get an appointment. Um, and then again, they might have to figure out how they're going to get to the doctor's office if it's um, a few hours away. Um, next slide. So per the latest survey data, um, two thirds of farm workers in the US reported being most comfortable communicating in Spanish um, and or an indigenous language, and they may not be bilingual providers or interpretation services available, which can deter uh, many farm workers from seeking out care. Um, it'll be difficult for them to make appointments or request information due to these language barriers. There are also a diversity of health beliefs in farm worker communities that can inform their health behaviors um, and how they might see their treatment options. And those views might be different or clash with that of their providers. So that might be another potential reason to not seek out care. Uh, next slide. Um, for farm workers, particularly those who are undocumented, there's still a lot of fear and misconceptions around the implications of using public benefits, um, such as, you know, Medicaid. A farm worker patient um, might avoid engaging with the medical establishment because they're afraid it'll impact their immigration status or that of a family member. Um, farm workers might also be fairly isolated in the U.S. and lack the support they would normally rely on if they were to get sick in their home countries. Um, from their family or community, so they might not just want to navigate an unfamiliar health system on their own. Um, and lastly, there's there's just fear around receiving a cancer diagnosis. So farm workers 
might be reluctant to even seek out a screening or follow up appointment to confirm that diagnosis. Next slide. So beyond these um, considerations, there's also systemic barriers to accessing medical care. As I mentioned, um, the lack of specialty providers, um, patients might see different doctors at different clinics instead of going through one cohesive network. So that makes it more likely that these patients will discontinue care at some point and be lost to follow up. Um, many of the patients who are participating in our project are coming to the free skin cancer screenings um, because they're unable to get appointments from, with primary care providers or dermatologists. Um, and that includes at our, their local health centers. Um, and in the study, we've been able to work with pro bono doctors with, who have their own limited availability and been able to get patients in sooner than is typical. But generally, um, there are extremely long wait times to see a dermatologist, um, sometimes several months. So with this kind of patchwork of care, patients aren't really building a relationship over time with one provider who knows their full medical history. So um, it makes it more likely they might, um, any changes in skin conditions might not get noticed. Next slide. So now we're gonna look at how all of these barriers might present in an actual patient who is enrolled in our study. Um, we're gonna call them patient two. This patient was, is a farm worker who was screened at a community skin cancer screening event in San Diego County last year um, and was found to have a suspicious lesion by our on-site dermatologist. Um, this patient only spoke Spanish um, and because of their work schedule um, and their self-connection, it was difficult to reach them. So it was the intervention of the patient navigator who was able to support by coordinating with the patient's family to schedule a follow-up appointment to get a biopsy done. Um, and through the project, um, there we have a pro bono dermatologist with a Spanish speaking staff who was willing to perform the biopsy free of charge, um, which helped because this patient had um, financial constraints. And after the biopsy results came back, the patient was diagnosed with um, early stage melanoma. Um, and in trying to find treatment options to get the melanoma excise, um, our project approached different charity care pro programs um, but none of them would accept the patient because it was not seen as an urgent enough case to be treated through the charity care system. Um, and one of the reasons we approached kind of larger hospital systems was because of the need for follow-up care. So the hope was that getting a patient into a larger hospital system would facilitate them being seen for subsequent six months or one year check-ins. Next slide, please. So we were also able to find a dermatologist through the study who um, offered to perform the excision procedure at cost, um, but that was also um, too expensive for this patient. So that was covered with funds from our research study. And we know that the post-treatment guidance is to schedule follow-up appointments to ensure that the cancer doesn't come back after the excision. Um, but we found out that follow-up care was not covered by the pro bono dermatologists or by charity care as it was considered separate treatment from the treatment of the initial melanoma. Um, this patient was initially uninsured, but again, through the support of the patient navigator, um, we were able to connect them to enrollment assistance um, and they were assessed to be eligible for Medi-Cal. Um, once they received their Medi-Cal card and were able to ready to schedule their first follow-up appointment with a dermatologist, um, their primary care doctor refused to provide them with a referral. Um, they told them that no follow-up care was necessary because the melanoma had already been removed. Again, this is um, another area where greater education on the risks of skin cancer recurring is really important, um, not just for the patient, but for providers. And this is also another area where the patient navigator was sort of instrumental in being able to advocate for the patient. So when the primary care doctor refused to provide the referral, the navigator reached out to the specialist, performed the excision um, to get a letter of referral. Um, and this process required coordination from the patient, um, their family, the navigation team, study coordinators, pro bono providers in order to get that referral. Um, and at press time, so now um, the patient and navigation team is still trying to establish the best option for follow-up care for this patient. 
Um, so this is just one case, but beyond the particular circumstances of this patient, you can see how in trying to obtain care for them, we ran up against many barriers that are inherent to the US healthcare system. So limitations on eligibility for health coverage, limited charity care resources, and limited number of specialists and primary care providers, um, some of whom may not fully understand the breadth of care that's required for treating skin cancer. Next slide, please. So it's also important to um, point out what was working in our favor in this particular case. So the patient um, proactively sought out a community skin cancer screening. They prioritized getting treatment when they learned of their diagnosis. Um, they were also able to depend on a bilingual family member to provide language interpretation support, um, as well as emotional and logistical support throughout the entire process, which again took a few months. Um, this patient was also willing to work with their navigator and all of the pro bono providers in the study to go through screening and treatment. Um, this includes going through a lengthy process for enrolling in health insurance, um, charity care program, paperwork, et cetera. Um, next slide. So some takeaways for how providers and clinics um, can better support pharma care patients with skin cancer. Um, as we've seen from this case study, trained patient navigators can really make all the difference because of the range of uh, logistical and financial barriers that farm workers have to deal with in trying to get medical care. Um, and having a navigator on hand really to support them through all of these different stages of care um, can lead to better health outcomes. Um, and because diagnosis and treatment frequently involve specialty care beyond uh, the rural healthcare system generally used by farm workers, um, our hypothesis is that a navigator program is really well suited to provide a central point of contact for patients to ensure that they're able to kind of continue from screening, um, diagnostic tests, treatment, and then follow-up care for skin cancer. Um, language continues to be a big barrier. So having Spanish speaking staff on hand if possible, being able to connect patients to interpretation services can help farm workers feel comfortable receiving health information and build trust, um, and then connecting farm worker patients to an enrollment navigator to help educate them about their insurance options um, and identify financial assistance options um, and alleviate some of the concerns um, that are very real about medical costs. Um, and then the final point is that farm workers are a patient population with really unique needs. Um, they face a higher risk than the general population of developing skin cancer, and we've seen it can be quite challenging for them to access high quality, uh, affordable, cultural appropriate uh, medical care. So it's very important to continue educating um, your fellow providers, uh, working together to come up with solutions to bridge some of the gaps that we see in our healthcare system. Next slide, please. So um, I know, I think that Dr. Green had to hop off, but I just wanted to pause here to see if there were any questions. I'm still here. I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't bail yet. The residents are <laughs> taking care of everything. Okay. I got a Perfect. colleague to help me out. That's lovely. So if you have questions for Dr. Green or myself, um, please feel free to take yourself off mute or you can also um, pop them in the chat or a comment. Or two. Yeah, and I see a comment about the charity care program. Um, I think we've seen a lot of variability in what um, what patients are seeing as kind of urgent enough cases. Um, there's obviously limited resources there. So um, it was an education for all of us uh, in the study. Any questions for myself, Dr. Green? Hi, this is Sue Boyko. I want to, I'm, for the people that don't know me on the chat, I'm uh, one of the dermatologists in San Diego. And I don't know that farm worker justice can do this by itself. But I think that if physicians were given malpractice insurance, there are so many retired physicians and more coming in each day, and they still love what they're doing. They just don't love the administration, the hassles, but 
any federally qualified health clinic could have a dermatologist at their disposal to help with these patients if they would just pay their malpractice insurance. So I urge Pharmacor Justice to get together with the AMA and other organizations to support using the brain power and hand power of dermatologists and other specialists, especially for farm workers. Thank you, Dr. Boyko. Um, that's a really important point. Um, and for those who are unaware, Dr. Boyko has been uh, really on the front lines of all of these community screenings we've done in uh, San Diego County with Vista Community Clinic um, and has a ton of experience with farm worker patients. Okay. Um, all right, if there are no more questions or comments, um, we can go to the next slide. So um, this is just a quick survey. It's three questions. Um, we hope that you uh, got something out of this training. Um, let us know, um, you can just click the link there and take the poll. Um, next slide. Um, and we just wanna thank everyone today for joining us on this training. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat here. Nina, if you have any questions about our project or any questions for Dr. Green, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Well.